Well now, um, that, that discussion was, was rather teed up beautifully, our next discussion, uh, because IT and the importance that IT is going to play in this future of ours, uh, highlighted by one of the questions, but also I don't know whether you've seen, actually why don't the people who are going to leave, let me promise you one thing, he's dashing out, you won't get a chance to chat. <laughs> I know it's very funny, sometimes people sort of leap out thinking um, the Secretary of State might be their new best friend if they can nobble him at the gate. Never happens, never ever happens. Um, but those of you who wish to know a bit more about sort of the digital future, I'll just point your attention um, to the Telegraph today because it's a fantastic headline. Digital technology could help save the NHS from financial meltdown. Um, not a small boast, really, is it? Uh, I, I said that to the next panel. I said this is what they were facing. This is the headline in the national press just today. And they all said, wonderful, uh, brilliant, will be done by lunchtime. Let me tell you a little bit more about Professor Robert Wachter, who you've heard about. He's a professor and associate chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of California, as you have already heard. But we also have an excellent panel to discuss the implications of relying more and more on big data. Uh, we have with us Dame Fiona Caldicott, who is the chair of the University, Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust, and also the National Data Guardian. Uh, we have got with us Linda Thomas, Chief Executive of Macmillan Cancer Support, and Dr. Sean O'Hanlon, Chief Medical Officer of EMS Health. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Um, so I just ought to really preface uh, Bob's contribution. He's known as the digital doctor, right? You also came slightly with a digital voice today. Uh, yes. Bob's voice is, is on its knees at the moment. We're very grateful that he's fighting through the pain. He does, though, ironically sound a bit like Darth Vader. Um, so please put your hands together and welcome the digital doctor, Bob Ochter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, I managed to come up with this <clears throat> laryngitis in the last couple of days. I'll be relatively brief. I was just advertised as the man from America. Uh, I am not Donald Trump. Let me make that clear. <laughs> uh, how did my voice get this way? Yesterday, I thought I'd take a nice little boat ride on the Thames. <laughs> and found myself in the middle of a shouting match. Um, I looked up this morning, a cure is for laryngitis, and you see here, I am a doctor, but I figured I'd learn from the internet. Looked it up, here are some of the cures. Uh, this is the one I like best. A few sips of cognac an hour before singing. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it did not work, so here we go. Uh, I was asked by the Secretary of State to lead a review of uh, digitization in the NHS with a particular focus on the secondary care hospital sector. And this was the context of our review. Uh, NP fit mostly failed to meet its goals, you all know that. The GP sector uh, digitization has actually gone extraordinarily well. You're essentially 100% digital in the GP sector. The five-year forward view demanded another effort aimed at digitization and interoperability. There has been a fair amount of preparatory work in the form of the National Information Board and 4.2 billion pounds allocated by the Treasury to support digitization this time around. As Jeremy said, I think there was an interest in learning not only from the experience in the past in the UK, but also from the experience in the United States. And the US has had recent experience with digitization uh, in the form of $30 billion allocated to digitize the American health system, and in many ways it worked better than uh, NP Fit did, and yet there were some problems with it and lessons that have been learned. This is our commission, uh, our advisory board, and you see here that the majority of the members are from the UK, uh, including Linda Thomas, who you'll hear from later. 
uh, a, uh, this is a, an all-star uh, group from the United States as well, a mixture of people who are experts in transformation, digitization, uh, patient, uh, the patient point of view, GP point of view, uh, hospital organization, um, usability, and I am very, very pleased with this committee. Everyone on the committee uh, did this work uh, without compensation. And the bottom line, or the, in some ways the big picture, is that all healthcare systems, the U.S. and the U.K. and others, are going through two transformational trends. One is the pressure to deliver high value care, uh, the shorthand we use in the U.S., and I think some here, deliver care that's better, safer, more accessible, and less expensive. The second is the digitization of the healthcare system. To my mind, the dominant issue today is the one you've been discussing with the STPs and all of that, which is how do we deliver care better, safer, less expensively? I will guess that 10 years from now, we will say that the dominant issue will have been digitization. Digitization not for digitization's sake, but digitization as a mechanism to transform care. Why do I say that? Partly because I live in San Francisco, and I have seen what digitization has done to the taxi industry, to the book industry, to journalism, to essentially every field that it touches. It's the most robust mechanism for transformation that we have seen in modern life, and I don't see any reason to believe that healthcare will be different, but you have to begin by digitizing the system, and that's where we are. Two of the key findings that I <clears throat> came upon in doing the research that I did for my book, and I spent about a year studying this issue and interviewing about 100 experts throughout the United States and some from the UK as well. One of them was this issue of what's called adaptive versus technical change. One of the reasons we get IT wrong is that we assume that it's technical change, meaning it's straightforward. You just put in the system, turn on the switch, and it's all good. Why do we assume that? We assume that because that's the way our iPhone works. It seems easy, seems straightforward. Digitizing complex healthcare organizations is the absolute opposite of that. It's known as adaptive change. As uh, Ron Heifetz from Harvard said, adaptive change is problems that require people themselves to change. Inadaptive change is the people are the problem and the people are the solution and leadership is about mobilizing and engaging those people with the problem rather than trying to anesthetize them so you can go off and solve it on your own. One of the core problems of NPFIT was a lack of understanding of the nature of adaptive change, the idea that you could digitize centrally and that the clinicians would simply accept it and begin using these systems effectively. We now understand that that is wrong. The second key finding that I came up with in studying this problem was of the productivity paradox. And the producti productivity paradox is a term coined by MIT professor Eric Brynjolfsson in 1993. <clears throat> and the paradox was in industry after industry, they digitized financial services, manufacturing, they digitized and they said, well, this is going to improve quality, decrease variations, and massively improve productivity. And a year went by, two years went by, and not much happened. And that's the paradox. Why wasn't digitization leading to the benefits that were expected? This quote from Nobel Prize winning economist in 1986 captures the issue after digitizing uh, financial services. He wrote, you can see the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics, meaning that the promised benefits were not being realized. The good news about the productivity paradox is that it ultimately is resolved. And I'm quite confident that it will be resolved in the health system, but it does take time. The two keys for unlocking the productivity paradox, for fixing the paradox, are the first is the technology needs to get better, and clearly, particularly in the hospital sector, it does need to get better. The GP sector, as we'll hear later, it's actually quite good, and it's been refined over decades. The second, though, is more interesting, more complex, and ultimately more important. The second is people have to reimagine the work. The instinct in the beginning is you put in technology and you keep doing the work the way you've always done it. You just are doing it digitally. And then people come in and say, why are we doing it this way? Why do we write notes this way? Why do we deal with consultants this way? And people begin to say, oh, we can actually completely rethink the work in a digital environment. That is what needs to happen. To make both of these happen, you have to have better technology, but in particular, you need to have people on the ground in the trust who understand the work and understand the connection between the clinical work and the technology. That's crucially important. 
So with that, let me end with 10 insights that I think are relevant to our review. We were supposed to come out with the results of our review this week. Uh, we got perded. I don't know if that's a verb, but uh, we were pushed back because of PERDA. So we're not coming out with our recommendations now. We will in, uh, in early September. But here are some of the findings that our committee came up with that are relevant to our recommendations. The purpose of digitization is not to digitize. It's to improve care. It's to improve quality, safety, efficiency, and the patient experience. Just digitizing for digitize, digitization's sake is not the idea. Clinician buy-in and engagement is absolutely essential. It's not elective. You can't achieve the benefits from digitization if the clinicians are not fully engaged in the systems, not just in the beginning, but over time, because that's how the productivity paradox is resolved. In the U.S., a national program that offered dollars to subsidize local purchases of IT systems that met certain national standards worked brilliantly. There were problems with it, but one of the things that it did do in distinction, in, uh, in contrast to NPFIT and to Connecting for Health, was we went from 10% of hospitals in the U.S. having advanced electronic health records in 2010 to 95% today over a very short period of time. So that mechanism of having central dollars not completely pay for systems, but partly pay subsidized systems, but local control over which system you bought, how you implemented it, in the U.S. at least that worked very well, and I think there are lessons from that. That said, the advantages of the U.K.'s national system, including the spine, the single patient ID, and other advantages, should be leveraged in one of our mantras within our advisory group was to learn the lessons of NPFIT but not over learn them, meaning NPFIT failed partly because it was overly centralized. That doesn't mean that everything should be local. There probably are some things that centralization is the right call on and achieving that balance feels to us to be quite important. The government tendency to over-regulate over IT should be resisted. Information technology moves along too quickly for the government to overmanage it. And I think NPFIT partly showed that. But even in the U.S., where the government does not run the healthcare system, we have gotten into this trap, and we're actually trying to pull back on the amount of government regulation. Interoperability, as the gentleman who asked the question, I think, uh, implied, interoperability is cru crucial for many reasons. So as the hospital sector digitizes, it's very important to bake it in as an expectation right from the beginning. We did not do that in the U.S., and we're now having to go back to the drawing board and build in uh, the connectivity that we need. User-centered design must be a core value. Most health IT systems are not built with the user in mind, whether it's a clinician or a patient. I think the GP systems have been to some extent because they were built by clinicians in the hospital. That's hard to do, but it, it, it's a very, very important sensibility. IT systems need to evolve and mature. The system that you put in on day one is not the system that you will have over time. They have to be transformed. You buy a system maybe from a vendor, but over time it has to evolve. And therefore, you must have people on the ground in the trust who understand clinical medicine, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and others, and also understand the technology. Here, the term for those systems is CCIOs. That workforce in the UK is very thin, very small, not particularly professionalized. And to me, it's going to be very important to change that situation. In a hospital like mine, which is similar in size to a large trust in the UK, there are about 20 doctors, nurses, and others in my hospital who have advanced training in clinical medicine and in informatics who have anywhere between 30 to 80 percent of their day allocated to do the work of connecting the clinical work with the IT system. That's very unusual in the UK, and I think that has to be improved. The IT system is just the backbone. You must have the culture, the people, and the flexibility to innovate and reimagine the work on that backbone. And that really is the nature of adaptive change. And be careful about over-promising. Remember the productivity paradox. I understand the issue of getting these systems in and doing some cheerleading to get moving. You have to understand, I think, that usually the productivity advantages, despite what the Telegraph said this morning, are not seen in the first year or two. They take time to, aver, uh, to emerge and evolve. That's not an excuse for delay, because it takes time from the day that you put in your system. And so you have to get started. To me, it's absolutely time to get started in digitizing the hospital sector 
sector in the UK and to do it correctly. And that's why it's been such a privilege to have an opportunity to uh, be part of this, this process. So let me end there and uh, stay tuned for our final report, which will come out in early September. Thank you very much. Um, I have some water. Have, Thank a, you. have a rest. Actually, uh, does anyone have? I mean, you, this may not mean anything to you. A fisherman's friend or a locket oh, I'm, or something. I'm, if you do, just chuck it on the stage. It's going to be sort of like the NHS confed version of a rock concert, not knickers, <laughs> medication. Just throw something up. Um, or cognac. Or cognac. No one will have cognac. <laughs> We're not that kind of crowd. Um, so we have an excellent panel to discuss some of those, uh, those matters that have been raised by Bob. And I know, though, the issue... Somebody really did throw it. I love you lot. That's great. In all seriousness, is it isn't a fish. No, fisherman's friend okay. is just... We'll sort you out. But in that lieu is. of that, have a strepsil. Um, <laughs> other medication is available. Uh, so we, are, we can discuss this further because we have with us an excellent panel. Dame Fiona Caldercott is with us, the National Data Guardian. And we've got uh, Linda Thomas as well, Chief Executive of Macmillan Cancer Support. And Dr. Sean O'Hanlon, Chief Medical Officer at EMIS Health. Um, can I start with you, um, Dame Fiona? I know you also have a report pending about data security, which is any time we talk about computer systems and big data, the next heartbeat will bring concerns about security of said big data. Um, yours is going to come out a bit sooner than Bob's, I take it? Yes, so our review hopefully will come out the week after the referendum is held and it also covers um, the request of Secretary of State for us to develop a simple model for the public and the professions which enables patients to consent and or opt out into the way that their data is used, which is one of the principal anxieties that some people have. Well, I, I don't want to force you to lift the powder at all, but, but just should we be feeling confident that we have a roadmap uh, which will make people comfortable enough to travel this route that Bob has laid out? I believe that we will. We've listened a lot to the public. We've listened to the professions and the interested organisations. There is a need for more consistency of data security across health and care, and we've developed a number of recommendations to help professionals put that consistency in place and therefore to reassure the public, who already trust the NHS to a large degree, but to assure the public that they can trust it even more with their data. And we have come up with a simple model which chimes very much with what we heard from Bob about the importance of the clinical view and the clinical input, not least because it is to the clinicians that the public go when they want to know what their rights are in relation to their data and how it can be used or safeguarded. So there, there, there seems to me to be a two-tier issue of trust here. There's, there's one that the patient needs to trust the clinician to look after their most sensitive data. But there's also an issue of the, the clinician has to trust the system that they are entering said data into. Now, um, I mean, maybe this is more relevant for you, Sean, but, but we have a track record, a rocky track record on little data in this country. Doctors' letters going out on time. And I myself went on a hospital visit. I'm fine, thanks for asking. Uh, but I was waiting in a, in a waiting room where they had uh, computerised the system the day before and people were running around like their hair was on fire and they couldn't find me. And I was sitting right in front of them and they couldn't find me. So um, that trust, how do you bring that online when you've got such a lofty aim ahead of you? Yeah, I think, I think it's important to learn from our successes as well as some of our failures. I think, um, you know, if you look at what happened in primary care, it has, as Bob, as Bob and that Jeremy Hunt points out, it's been very effectively digitised. And that was done through suppliers and through clinicians engaging together to co-design systems that were fit for purpose for clinical use. I think if you look at some of the failings around the national programmes back in, back in the 2000s, then a lot of those systems weren't designed with a clinical intent, they were designed for administrative purposes. And we're still suffering some of the legacy around systems designed essentially to work the, work the important part of the NHS, the, the, the business side of the NHS, but they're not really connected to what the clinicians want to get out of those systems. And it's that engagement with the clinicians, and I think you know, Bob's points about the CCOs, our CCOs is absolutely vital. The leadership within the hospital trust is absolutely but vital. But also said bake it in early, which means that you know this is all a supply, yep. like so much that we talk about here, it's supply line and getting to the supply line really early on. But you've got a whole wealth of talent here that hasn't been pre-baked 
that's a bit doughy, shall we say that, in IT terms? Yeah, it is doughy. And, and you know, the engagement needs to happen now. Uh, you know, Bob's presenting a framework to enable that to happen. Um, suppliers, the NHS, the clinicians need to work together, along with procurers, to, to actually enable the full throw, the flow through of not only the, the systems, but also the finance. They're going to the right position to actually give the, the users the, the systems they need. It's, um, about, it's about being also connected to the way the NHS is changing. You know, we're moving away from stovepipe primary care and secondary care, moving towards an integrated care where people will freely throw, flow between primary, secondary. They'll be sitting in the interim, in, in, sort of in, in piece of care that are new to us with these new models of care. And the interoperability work that's being done in the NHS is going to be instrumental in enabling us to connect that record. Your point about letters getting lost, the electronic interoperability is now being created by the NHS and by suppliers together. That's really important. Um, we've, Linda Thomas from uh, Macmillan, Cancer Support. Cancer has been on the forefront of this for, for some time. Um, can, you, can you cite places where actually access to this one click of, of information has made a difference? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not surprisingly, I'd like to bring it back to the benefits, actually. What does it mean to the patient? What does it mean to the person? And perhaps just share an example of where things haven't gone well and what it means when data doesn't flow smoothly. So just to remind people of, of a case involving a young lady, she was 13 years of age, her name was Tamara, she was diagnosed with asthma. Over a two year period she had 47 visits to primary and secondary care. There was no coordinated care and joined up care and as a result no one noticed her condition was deteriorating and she sadly passed away. And, and that's what happens when the data flow doesn't go well. Um, you're right, actually, I've seen some amazing examples of when things do go very well. And I was recently down in Kent and Canterbury and looking at some work that's been done there, interestingly, with um, a chief information officer who's a, who's a doctor who's baked into the system already and the way that they are joining up the front end. So the, the data that comes in about patients who will be arriving in ambulances and joining up that with the back end in terms of what are the beds for those people and if not, can they be redirected elsewhere? That's a brilliant example of for the patient, it's got to be so much better when they arrive knowing that they will be cared for immediately. And so I think just bringing it back to that, that's why it's important. So are, I know there are issues, but if we talk about the benefits, mm -hmm. actually, it, it seems a no-brainer. Um, we're going to take some questions. We've only got a couple of minutes for questions, sadly. Please um, look for bat people and put your hands up. Uh, but just a question to all of you, any, any of you who, who would like to take this. Is there ever, because expectations are so high, I mean, this, the headline is not unique that I read to you, but it just happens to be from this morning, that it's going to save the NHS from financial meltdown, it's going to save money, it's going to, sa it's going to save all sorts of things. Um, is there a danger that with this focus and expectation that we're going to have clinicians who are looking at spreadsheets more than they're looking at patients, perhaps? Sure. I mean, I, I think the, uh, we have seen that as a problem in the US where the doctors now in a digital system are spending a lot of time looking down and not looking at patients. In fact, the fastest growing clinical profession in the US is scribes, people being hired to feed the computer so the doctor and patient can look each other in the eye. That's partly a problem with the amount of documentation we ask the doctors to and nurses to put in, partly a problem with the, the, the state of the systems. So we have to be attentive to that. If we create a system where the doctors are focusing only on the computer, not on the patient, we'll, we will have blown it. On the other hand, there's a lot of information about the patient that is in the system. And so it's a balance. We have to get it right. Uh, right now, I'd rather have them balancing that, but know that all the information they need is in a system than rifling through pieces of paper trying to figure out what's going on. Dave Fiennes. Well, it illustrates the fact that we're really recommending that there should be a huge attention to the education and training of people at every level in the health and care system in order to reap the benefits, as Linda's described them, for the patient. We have to help our people know how to do this as well as possible so they're not looking at the screen when actually the patient is engaging in a relationship with them. And that's a challenge for all of us in this room to make sure that's as good as possible. Mm. Um, let's ask who has a question, anybody? Number two, yes, let's go there. <coughs> Julia Cumberbatch. Um, I'd like to ask a question about maternity services because it seems to me they are the patient group who are really technically up with this century. Their life is on their iPhone, their iPads, and all the rest of it. Can we not do some sort of a, um, a first off, an experiment with that particular group, ensuring that they get their uh, care records, everything that they want to 
give over to the NHS uh, through um, the different services, because it needs to link up, of course, hospital and the community services. So sure. please experiment okay. with that. Linda. I, I was just going to talk about something that I saw recently when I was in Nottingham, in, in, at the hospital in Nottingham. Uh, their innovation team have come up with a really brilliant app, which effectively is, is my midwife, and they have all of that information available. So it might be worth picking up because I think it is already happening in places. And that is where the patient is able to access every single thing that they need via an app on their uh, telephone, which was brilliant. I, I'm going to take one more question. I know we're going over time, but uh, let's go to number four. Just to, this will have to be the last question, sadly. Yes. Uh, Brita Korsh, Elsevier Clinical Solutions. Uh, question for Professor Wachter. Um, working with our uh, customers in hospital customers in the US, we see that clinical decision support based on evidence based best practice is absolutely integral to the way that they work. Could you comment on your observations about what that means for the UK and where the NHS is going? Thank you. I completely agree with that, actually. The decision support is one of the elements of the productivity paradox that you have to fix, meaning the system has to come in. You have to begin, replace all your paper with computer, but out of the box you don't get the decision support that tells you this is the best way to manage a patient with sepsis or pneumonia or a GI bleed, you essentially have to either build that yourself or adopt other, other systems that do that. Uh, we've visited, as part of our process, four or five trusts, and we, be, we saw pretty good levels of decision support being adopted at Salford and Addenbrooke's other places. To us, it felt like one of the keys is that they did have people in the trust who understood the technology and understood clinical medicine, understood the evidence, but you're absolutely right. The benefits that you get from just computerizing, there are some, you won't give a patient a medicine that they're allergic to and you can read the doctor's handwriting, but it's really the robust decision support that guides you to doing the best thing, the evidence-based thing, that unlocks the real advantages of these systems. So it's crucially important. Um, could you please join with me in thanking a really splendid panel uh, on a very important subject. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, to Bob Officer, Fiona Carter Cross, Linda Thomas, and Sean O'Hanlon. Um, I've got a little announcement. Um, there may be some of you uh, who are interested in a certain game of football with a right shaped ball, by the way, Bob. Um, it is uh, because we care at the NHS Confederation about your well being. Don't go hiving off to a pub. We've got it in the main arena, so you'll find a place to watch the football. Um, and those of you who aren't interested in football, there are plenaries going on. We will reconvene here at 4.30. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>